So hello everyone, my name is uh, Claire Rubble. I am one of the co-organizers of this webinar from the University Pompion Assess in Paris, and I am delighted to chair the fourth session of the webinar, which is devoted to surveillance and privacy. At the start of today's conference, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respect to elders past and present. So our first speaker is Dr. Yelena Grigorievich, who is a lecturer at the ANU College of Law and also one of the co-organizers of this conference. Um, she specializes, specializes sorry, in media law and constitutional law and theory. Her doctoral thesis examined the conflict between privacy and freedom of expression in the law of misuse of private information. She has recently published articles on children's privacy and on privacy being at the intersection of public and private law. The paper she's presenting today is entitled Privacy as Liberty and Security, Implications for the Legitimacy of Governmental Surveillance. So, uh, Yelena, if you're ready, um, we can listen to your presentation. Thank you, Claire, and thank you to everyone who's joined this session. So, as Claire mentioned, my paper concerns how governmental surveillance in particular is legitimized in liberal society and specifically how the interference with individual privacy is justified in moral terms, which justification then informs our legal frameworks for governmental surveillance. Now, we know that privacy is implicated, interfered with, whenever surveillance policies and practices are uh, implemented and a prominent argument deployed to justify the privacy intrusive nature and consequences of governmental surveillance is security and more precisely collective security. So only on Tuesday, the head of the Australian Signals Directorate said in a speech she delivered here at the ANU that secret surveillance against Australians themselves is, I quote, the very capability that we use to keep Australia safe. And even though national security is occupied, has occupied the forefront of surveillance justifications and methods, as is evident in our time, especially in the years following the 9-11 attacks, medical or health security is a growing concern raised to support governmental use of intrusive surveillance tools, including cellular monitoring of individuals' movements and interactions with others. So also on Tuesday this week, the Victorian health minister justified in the Victorian parliament the six-month legislative extension of governmental emu emergency powers by contending that a failure to extend the state of emergency would mean, and I quote, we would literally fall off a cliff. So that's an interesting use of the word, literally. Now, these powers that are implemented in Victoria have included fine-grained monitoring of individuals' movements and strict enforcement of quarantines and curfews in what can be called extreme surveillance measures or otherwise straightforward curtailments of basic liberties. And we have seen how the governments in many liberal states have, in the pandemic, quickly opted for apps or even more intrusive um, measures, including tracking devices physically attached to individuals' bodies in order to track individuals and sometimes process their medical data. So the state is effectively following or monitoring individuals' actions and interactions and then storing and using the, this detailed data about individuals who are being tracked. And there are so far varying approaches to enforcement in different liberal states, where some states make such apps or measures voluntary with a good dose of encouragement to subject yourself to it, and others make certain liberties or access to certain services conditional upon subjecting yourself to such surveillance. Now, the overarching justificatory theme here in these particular circumstances is medical and health security during what many states have categorized as an emergency, even as a disaster, as illustrated by the Victorian state's actions, for example. But none of these states have yet, at least, openly declared that they are no longer liberal democracies, that this is now um, a state of exception where the normal precepts do not apply. So we have to address the moral philosophical precepts of a liberal society, those fundamental principles that underpin the legitimacy of governmental action in 
such societies. So in the paper, I argue that a liberal in a liberal polity, security is in fact not a moral panacea for justifying interferences with privacy through governmental surveillance. And this is because security alongside liberty is embedded in the concept of privacy. It is the very reason why privacy is cherished and protected and arguably informs how we conceptualize the value of privacy. So positioning a broad conception of security against individual privacy is therefore an inaccurate opposition and arguing that privacy must give way whenever large scale security concerns are raised is based upon a false conflict and is inconsistent with the moral demands of a liberal polity. So that's my central point here. The way in which appealing to security and sometimes liberty in broad terms is insufficient to legitimize the liberal state's use of surveillance methods because of how they interfere with individual privacy. Now, in order to demonstrate the centrality of security and liberty within privacy, I first clarify in the paper what I mean here by liberty and security. So as to liberty, I draw upon the main philosophical perspectives on the concept of liberty, those being positive liberty, negative liberty, and civic republicanism, to find exactly what the common commonly held element is of liberty. And I find that the common denominator of these three diverging perspectives is the basic capacity of an individual to make choices in his or her own life. That is the tenet of liberty, which each of these three perspectives seeks to guarantee, or at least to facilitate, albeit in uh, vastly different ways. And as for security, I draw upon the etymology of the concept, which has been tracked by other scholars, including most prominently Michael Dillon, and find that the essence of security is the rudimentary capacity to control a defined sphere in, one, in one's life to the exclusion of external harm or hindrance. So the main part of this paper seeks to demonstrate the centrality to privacy of these deeper moral concerns for security and liberty. And the way in which I approach this is to identify the philosophical underpinnings of privacy, the reasons why privacy is valued, and indeed why it has been juridified as a right in many liberal societies, why it is protected by law and therefore not subject to easy elimination by societal or popular trends. And so we see that privacy is underpinned by many and varying values, including, of course, dignity and personhood, autonomy, psychological sanctity, intimacy, the cultivation of relationships, intellectual development, personal self-reflection, including, of course, freedom of expression, and the individual's ability to participate in society. So these are the reasons identified by theorists and jurists for some time now, why individual privacy ought to be preserved and protected. And I go through each of these recognized underpinnings, identifying within each of them um, both of the moral concerns for liberty and security as I defined them earlier. So we see that the moral concern to protect individual privacy is constituted in every way by the deeper moral concern to protect and uphold individual security and individual liberty. So this then problematizes the liberal state's reach for security as the automatic or easy justification um, and, lit and legitimation of privacy intrusive surveillance. It involves pitting security against security, which has the potential at least to create analytical or logical difficulties. Now, there is of course this crucial issue of the collective versus the individual. And some might say that this would explain and resolve any problem or difficulty here. Surveillance justifiably interferes with individual security and liberty through privacy interference in order to uphold and protect collective security and liberty. But again, we have some concepts here that are left ambiguous or insufficiently anchored, both conceptually and morally. Exactly what counts as collective interests? And more importantly, exactly when can collective interests legitimize governmental interference with individual interests, especially those recognized to have immense and foundational moral import? And here I draw upon um, classic social contract theory as the bedrock of the liberal polity in the liberal state, where the state is bound to hold and exercise its power, governmental power, exclusively on trust for the net benefit of the individuals it governs. 
And this is a moral contract between each individual as such and the collective as such, which then both creates and legitimizes the interests of the collective or the state or governmental power as such. And this is very important because it confirms that in a liberal polity, liberty and security are values that are relational to the individual first and foremost. Their most basic definitions should be in terms of the interests of the individual as such. Any value of either liberty or security to the collective originates in and is derivative of their value to the individual. So this derivative relationship between individual interests and collective interests has implications for mounting a justification for privacy intrusive governmental surveillance, which relies upon the concept of security. It is insufficient to point to collective security or indeed collective liberty whenever that's invoked, given that what surveillance necessarily interferes with is individual security and individual liberty by virtue of its interference with individual privacy. And because the collective derives from the individual, justifying an interference with individual interests on the basis of protecting those very same interests in their collective shape is not enough to legitimize that interference. And the liberal state founded upon a social contract which not only recognizes but prioritizes individuals as the foundational and legitimating units of the polity as a whole is always obligated to do that to legitimate its actions ultimately in terms of the interests of the individual as such. So if collective security and liberty, say security against a pandemic, health security, are to justify privacy intrusive surveillance, say an app to track individuals' lives, then more detailed, particularized and evidence-based arguments are required to address the deeper moral concerns for individual security and individual liberty, with, which are both constitutive of the very morality of privacy. And that might well be achievable depending upon how the particular threat, a pandemic, has an overall effect on the lives of individuals. And it is that fine-grained analysis of costs and benefits to the lives of individuals that is missing whenever a state invokes collective security or collective liberty as a broad brush justification for deploying surveillance tools. So I'm going to leave it there, Claire, back to you. Right, so uh, thank you, Yelena. That was a perfect opening for a session on uh, surveillance and privacy, highlighting the numerous issues <laughs> involved here. Uh, and I, I found that the way you deconstructed the dichotomy between security and privacy is very helpful to uh, rephrase the, the terms of the discussion. Um, so we'll have the discussion um, at the end, and I will now um, introduce our second speaker. Um, who is uh, Professor Jennifer Merchant. Uh, so Jennifer teaches at the University of Pontillon Assas in Paris. Uh, her research privileges a pluridisciplinary approach at the crossroads of political science, law, gender studies, and bioethics. She is currently working on two projects, uh, one on gender and healthcare in France and the United States, and another on the framing of the human genome editing, sorry, human genome editing, uh, from a comparative perspective too. Uh, she has published books on articles and articles on human reproduction and has a forthcoming book on American women's right to privacy. Um, and today she's going to talk about the protection um, of genetic privacy. Um, so Jennifer, if you're ready, I will now mute myself and uh, let you uh, present your paper. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about um, actually three points. I'm going to raise three points in, in the short 10 minutes that we have. First, I wanted to thank Claire and Anne and the American, uh, the American, the Australian University for organizing this webinar. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, mostly legal, so I'm not going to get into the details. But of course, all the details are in the paper that I wrote for this talk. Uh, I'm first going to define what it, gen genetic privacy is. Um, I'm going to ask the question, are we protected? And I'm going to show that the answer to that is no. And I'll show from the least protected to the better protected, that is United States, Europe, France. And I will end with um, solutions to how we can be better protected. There are two possibilities, creating a genetic bill of rights uh, or each of us becoming owners of our DNA. 
which sounds crazy, but people are thinking about doing that. So what is uh, genetic privacy? It's been decided, it's been defined by a great many number of scholars over the past few years. And I would simply say that it is different from other types of information about ourselves. Um, it's totally different from um, your fingerprint or uh, your, your name or whether you're married or your race or your gender. It is in fact what George Annis uh, liked to call an intimate diary that has information about you um, about your past, about your future eventually, and about people around you. And sometimes it has information about you, your DNA, your DNA profile, that you don't even want to know, or that you might not want to know. For example, if you are going to die very young, or if you're going to pass on a serious disease, some people have argued that they have a right not to know what's uh, in their DNA. So uh, from the start, one can say that uh, your genetic information is highly different from any others and might require a special sort of protection. In the United States, there's a strong debate going on on a, the need for a constitutionally entrenched right to privacy, right to genetic privacy, such as we've seen in other areas of the right to privacy, such as, for example, women's right to privacy to decide whether or not to end an unwanted pregnancy. There are opponents uh, to this particular constitutional argument uh, that say, no, this, we don't need an, a whole nother law or a whole new set of rules. There are already plenty of regulations in place that protect an individual's genetic information. And I won't start quoting them to you, but the latest one to date is GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. But if one looks closely at GINA and um, tries to determine whether or not every American citizen's private genetic data is protected by GINA? The answer is no. Um, here's one example among many. Suppose uh, that, uh, well, at, from the start, GINA says, for example, uh, that health insurers and employers cannot discriminate against a woman if she, uh, at the initial medical exam that she takes, for example, uh, it is discovered that she has a positive test for a form of breast cancer. So she has the gene, she doesn't have breast cancer, but she has this particular propensity uh, to have to develop it. Um, Gina says that the employer and the health, health insurer, both private entities cannot refuse to hire her for that reason. Yet suppose some months later, uh, the woman develops breast cancer um, without having been, um, having been diagnosed prior um, with this particular, with having this particular gene, the, the, the gene no longer applies. Uh, her health insurer can refuse to either renew her policy or the employer can um, up the, uh, employ uh, the insurance rates that she's paying through her employer insurance um, because Gina doesn't cover the fact that she has become symptomatic. Now there's a very huge uh, data collection program going on in the United States right now as well as in France, as well as in England. And um, GINA does not apply to this particular program, which is called All of Us. If you want, I can give you some more information on that later on. Um, so now let's turn to the European Union. It would be far too long to, to, to lay out all of the weak points of uh, genetic privacy protection in the US. The European Union um, approaches this topic as well as France. England is going to be a different story now with Brexit uh, from a much different standpoint. Uh, while genetic privacy is, uh, the right to privacy is argued in the United States in terms of case law and jurisprudence, uh, privacy, an individual's privacy in Europe is considered as a human right, as is, um, as is what Bernie Sanders used to say during the campaign, health, access to health care. So the right to privacy in, in Europe and all types of privacy, all types of information are included now because of the GDRP, which is the latest European legal framework that was uh, passed. It also includes genetic data, health data, and all other types of sensitive data, which I'll get to in a minute. This right to privacy is explicit and it finds its source in the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In addition, the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms was adopted in 1950 and transformed this human right into a positive obligation on member states. So each member state has to abide by the idea that privacy and private information is um, belonging to the person, not in a sense of ownership, but is the person's private domain and cannot be violated or accessed without some form of procedure, which um, usually 
ends up to be simply between doctor and patient. But as we will see in France now, it has been given over this possibility of access to police forces. So getting to the latest um, framework, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, um, this has really increased the importance of surveillance by national committees uh, that are supposed to give their um, approval before any type of authorization or authority can access your private genetic data. Um, in France, this means that the CNIL, uh, which is the Commission on, um, I won't translate it now, it's all, it, it, is the, uh, it is the national agency that makes sure that every time uh, not only genetic data, but other personal data is going to be accessed that it is approved by the CNIL. Other countries have uh, similar uh, commissions and the GDRP has reinforced the powers of this commission to intervene and to make sure that there is no abuse in access to personal uh, data. In England, we are in limbo right now. Normally, of course, the United Kingdom was supposed to adhere to uh, the, GDR, the GDPR because it is, was part of the European Union. And um, now there are concerns that uh, England might revisit its uh, genetic privacy uh, protection laws because they also have a huge program going on um, called uh, the UK Genetics Collection Program. And they are, we, we are in limbo as to how England is going to foresee its protection in the near future. Just a few words on France. Uh, like I said, France, among the three entities that I've identified, the United States, Europe, and France, UK, UK and France. France is the country that protects our genetic information the, the most. I won't get into the details of that. The French bioethics law protects it. There are criminal sanctions. Um, the, uh, the way France adopted and reinforced even more the GDPR, uh, the European framework, is a testimony to this. And one of the uh, unique features of the French uh, approach to this question of uh, privacy, genetic privacy, is that any element of the human body, uh, be it a cell, uh, a gene, what have you, is considered as part of the human body, even when it exits the human body. So in other words, if you violate access to that information, then you are violating the human from whence it comes. Um, this doesn't mean that the person owns his tissues or cells or genes but it does mean that these tissue cells and genes are an extension of this person and therefore deserve full protection. Uh, in, not, in numerous articles, you may read genetic information is part and parcel of bodily integrity in that it is an element of the human body and its private nature. Thus, it is intrinsically inviolable. Now, that sounds um, very reassuring for French people. However, there are two uh, problems that are bring, that bring us up to the very very present day. First of all, um, the first concerns uh, are uh, lie with uh, law enforcement. In the 2000 and, and, and in 1998, excuse me, um, the FINAG was was created in France, which began to collect medical data, not medical data, excuse me, um, bodily uh, information. Um, et cetera, on rapists and sex offenders, and then began also connecting genetic data, uh, taking um, genetic samples from sexual offenders. This um, list, this, this uh, fichier is still in existence and was extended to suspects. And then in 2003, this was extended to any suspect of any crime. So today in France, there is a, a fichier, there's a list, of anybody who is a suspect of any sort of crime with their DNA profile. And this um, file includes people who are then released because they are, they are prosecuted, they are convicted. And for the person to get their DNA off the files, they have to go through a judicial process to have it removed. Now, this particular reality in France was condemned by the European Court of Human Rights in 2017. Um, arguing that, uh, number one, people who refused to give a genetic swab uh, when they were arrested for being suspect of anything, um, you know, stealing candy from a store or, or, or killing someone in the park, uh, the police now can take a genetic sample from you. When a person refused, one person refused to give their uh, sample and they were arrested and, and pr prosecuted under the, the, the law of 
that gives police the authority to correct to collect genetic data from suspects. And this young this person brought the case all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights and won against France. And in the decision itself, France also added that this particular difficulty for people who are simply suspects to get their DNA data off the, the, the rolls is also uh, something that had to be changed. And France hasn't changed it yet. yet. The second concern is, of course, get the, uh, with globalization and, and companies like 2,3andMe and Ancestry DNA or MyHeritage. Um, Despite strict prohibition in France, foreign private companies collect, analyze, and store a large amount of French genetic data for profit. French media even advertise for them. This is, of course, all illegal, but they do it anyway. French hospitals and universities collaborate and publish with these companies. There is, of course, and we all know this, a huge, huge craze on the part of Europeans and French people caught up with the idea of finding out who their ancestors were, finding a lost sibling if they were the result of artificial reproductive technologies. And this has created a whole parallel world that exists outside of the protections that Europe and France offers its citizens. Because once uh, you as a French person sign a consent form and send your DNA to 23andMe or Ancestry, you have given your consent to 23andMe. But as we know, just last week or 10 days ago, um, Ancestry DNA sold their entire database of genetic data profiles to another private equity company. And so now you have said okay to, to Ancestry DNA, but now your DNA is in the hands of a private equ equity company. You don't know what it's going to do with it. So there are two solutions. This is uh, the end of, of my talk that are being proposed to, to, to sort of rethink and revisit this whole problem of genetic privacy. And the first uh, is, and this has been um, put forth by the Council of Responsible Scientists for a long time now. Uh, the first is to draft an International Genetic Bill of Rights, uh, which, con which, which contains 10 amendments like the, the American Bill of Rights. And I will, not, um, <clears throat> I will not lay them out for you here because I, I don't have time, but there are 10 very specific to genetic data uh, uh, rights demanded to be protected. And for example, probably one of the most important ones is that there is that it is impossible to uh, commercialize in any shape or form um, genetic data. The second solution is uh, totally on the opposite end of the spectrum. And that is to allow each of us to become the owners of our DNA. And this has been translated by a legislative endeavor um, which has not come to fruition yet. For example, in Massachusetts, um, there is a bill that um, recognizes the monetary value of genetic information. And prior to sharing your genetic data, you must be uh, notified in writing and orally that your donation is a commodity. And if you have the intent, you may commercialize the genetic info and uh, you must be made aware and compensated at a fair value when you give your DNA to, for example, 2,3andMe or Ancestry DNA. You can also, according to this bill, bequeath to a surviving family member <clears throat> the authorization to use your genetic information as laid out in a will. So this would be just the totally opposite of a genetic. So this would be like the difference between the European Human Rights, Genetic Bill of Rights versus the American case-by-case uh, -case jurisprudence right to privacy uh, approach that does not consider genetic, uh, genetic information as, uh, as private as, as, as some might think. And I will end there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, for this fascinating and rather chilling uh, paper. Um, so we'll uh, move on directly to um, uh, the uh, third and last speaker. Um, so, Professor Jay uh, Clayton um, is William R. Kennan Professor of English and Director of the Kerb Center for Art, Enterprise and Public Policy at Vanderbilt University. Um, thank you for uh, joining us in the middle of the night uh, for, on your time. Um, so, uh, Jay Clayton is the uh, author or editor of numerous books and articles, and he is currently engaged in a multi-year interdisciplinary project funded by the U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute, that looks at the impact of literature, film, and popular culture on public attitudes towards uh, genetic privacy. And his paper is entitled uh, Overexposed Genetic Privacy on Film and Television. 
So uh, if you're ready, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, really fascinating conference. Uh, though it is 2 a.m., uh, it really it's fun to be up and participating in this new kind of format. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands dispossessed by treaty from the eastern branch of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, this is the treaty that led to the infamous Trail of Tears in the United States, which uh, crossed the Cumberland River in 1830 over a covered bridge in downtown Nashville, Tennessee, which is where Vanderbilt University is located. Uh, today, I'm going to talk with you about our multidisciplinary project that uh, Claire mentioned in her introduction. Uh, I want to start by uh, pulling up quickly a, a single slide uh, and speak to you about the uh, what the loss of genetic uh, privacy can entail uh, for people. Uh, many of the worries from the beginning uh, around privacy in the genetic sphere involved a variety of concerns like employment or health insurance concerns, discrimination against racial groups or people with disabilities, uh, the problem of stigmatization, which can come with uh, the identification of genetic conditions, uh, the reinforcement of ethnic, racial, sexual, or gender stereotypes. Uh, people have feared from the very beginning new forms of eugenics, uh, identification by law enforcement, which uh, as of uh, day before yesterday has become an even more uh, pressing problem since um, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, just proposed new regulations uh, uh, further loosening the ability to collect DNA from uh, people in custody. Uh, and uh, as I have, as Jennifer uh, hinted at, the DNA is stored in a disturbing variety of places. Uh, it can be held by health insurance, uh, uh, health insurance companies, um, and uh, uh, electronic medical uh, electronic medical records. Um, uh, research biobanks, uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies, patient advocacy groups, uh, open access repositories, uh, depositories of genomic samples collected by the police, the military, and other state agencies. Um, uh, I'm sorry, again, uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. Uh, of which there are 90 in the US alone and many more in other parts of the world. Uh, one disturbing uh, characteristic of it that is not perhaps as widely known as it should be, over a third of these companies in the United States offer surreptitious genetic testing, which is the ability to send in genetic samples from people without their knowledge, uh, to take samples from uh, items of clothing. Uh, the, the, the advertisements for this is sometimes covert, uh, sometimes quite explicit, uh, and goes by various uh, uh, unsettling names, including um, the perhaps the um, Perhaps the most uh, blunt name that I'm aware of is a company in the U.S. called SheCheats.com. Uh, this surreptitious testing is often used to to find a uh, to find evidence of infidelity, of course, but also to uh, trace. Uh, uh, trace the paternity of, of children so as to avoid alimony uh, in the case of divorce. Um, these threats can lead to widespread suspicion of genetic testing, which may impede important research or health procedures. Uh, and 
so that it is a, a concern uh, not merely for the risks that we have uh, specified, but also because of the, the difficulty of engaging in important research if, uh, if people become suspicious of genetic testing. Um, Lucy Cluzel, in her intriguing talk on smart cities earlier this week, advocated for addressing problems by surveillance uh, of problems of surveillance by legislation rather than litigation, a point with which I entirely agree. But there is also a third way of protecting privacy, and that is via public policy. Uh, at the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy, we define the policy sphere quite broadly. Uh, public policy takes place in a semi-autonomous sphere, which works through transdisciplinary committees to propose ethical guidelines, standards of care, norms of practice. And such standards can include best practices regarding data curation and security, including the design of encryption algorithms. Uh, the, the policy sphere differs from the uh, direct effort to pass legislation or to engage in litigation. Um, it is much more, as I've mentioned here, ad hoc. Committees that are created to work on policies governing genetic privacy and other areas of, um, of import uh, are convened by uh, non-governmental agencies uh, like the NIH, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, the WHO. They can also be put together by professional societies. Uh, almost every medical organization uh, has its own ethics committee or policy committee that put out such supports. I imagine most people are aware of these, um, the, these bodies of uh, of uh, the, uh, policy deliberation. Uh, we have perhaps the most uh, interaction with them uh, on a uh, regular basis in our universities via our IRB. There are also uh, international committees that are convened by or such organizations often in collaboration with one another. And these national, uh, these international uh, policy committees can be much more effective, I think, in governing and controlling the um, concern for privacy than uh, regulation, which on the international uh, scale is, is very, uh, uh, problematic. Um, to address this problem from an unusual direction, uh, we, we at Vanderbilt have formed a large transdisciplinary working group. Our project is funded by the NIH uh, and uh, encompasses 45 professors and graduate students and in some cases undergraduate students. Uh, I lead a team of six faculty in the humanities and social sciences, five graduate students, and four undergraduates. In, in addition, there are two other teams working on this grant, one composed of law and bioethics professors, uh, the other researchers and researchers in genetics, medicine, bioinformatics, computer science, economics, and health policy. Our for, on our team, our first step was to create a database of all the movies and television episodes that featured some aspect of genetics as a significant element in the plot, characters, or themes. Um, two independent researchers tagged each record uh, for, uh, for uh, 109 different attributes. Uh, including uh, attributes that had specifically to do with the films and TV episodes themselves, such as their genre, medium, and attitude toward genetics, uh, their scientific motifs, and 16 different perspectives on surveillance and privacy. 
uh, we created this database in order to uh, approach public attitudes towards genetics uh, and the representation of genetics in the kinds of images and memes that circulate in the broader culture. In addition, we downloaded 70,000 viewer comments from IMDB uh, and are analyzing them with some of the computer scientists on our team uh, uh, using topic model modeling and sentiment analysis. Uh, our goal is to study how media represents genetics in the age of big data. Uh, policymakers care deeply about public attitudes toward questions of data privacy. We look at the images and the memes that circulate and uh, work on uh, the dominant images that are uh, guiding public attitudes. Uh, my time is running out, uh, and so I want to briefly indicate uh, some of our findings so far. Uh, first, there has been an informational turn in how we think about privacy. Gavin Smith spoke in the prior session about the conduits of power that circulate via non-human machinery rather than through hum uh, human nodes. Uh, we've been able to document a cultural response to this shift by examining the changes over time in landmark films like Blade, the Blade Runner series or fiction like Margaret Atwood's The Mad Adam trilogy. Uh, second, we have found that breaches affect families and communities, not just individuals. And a, a powerful example of that is the, the uh, portrait of the multi-generational effects uh, that uh, it impacted the family of Henrietta Lacks after the uh, disclosure of her genetic information and her identity. Uh, third, that it is crucial to take into account the intersectional natures of harms. Such intersections include not only overlapping conditions of precarity, such as racism, sexism, class inequalities, or disability, but also the intersections among personal, familial, religious, and community lives. And finally, it is important for policymakers to acknowledge that the affective dimension of individual and community responses to genetic information is not superfluous, but fundamental to any research into public attitudes toward data privacy. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much for presenting. Um, um, research program, which sounds uh, very ambitious. <laughs> um, um, so um, we can now um, move on to the discussion. Um, I see that we already have um, a question for Jennifer, but I think it can be addressed by all three speakers uh, in the Q&R session, which is why uh, we are not owners of our own DNA already. And um, um, the, the prospects raised by the idea of monetizing DNA. Um, so I don't know, maybe Jennifer, if you want to respond to those questions. Oh, I'll, just say, I'll just say one or two things. The first is why are we not already owners? It depends on the legal system, the, the country or the legal system that you live in and how it has over time uh, considered the relationship between yourself and your body. So uh, contrary to what a lot of people think in the United States, uh, I mean, I hear a lot of people, researchers here in France say that oh, in the United States people own their DNA and that's not true. So the next question is um, why not? Um, I personally am not in favor of uh, monetizing our DNA, though I do understand that um, if you are the owner of your DNA, then you can do with it what you want. You can profit from it. You can make sure that uh, it is not abused, used, misused. Uh, but I still do not think that this is a, a means of protecting your genetic privacy. Uh, I think it's the worst scenario. Uh, available. 
Um, and that is why I am more or, or less in favor of some sort of international, even if it is a symbolic one, or as Jay was saying earlier, even if it is some sort of statement by an international organization like the WHO um, or, or the UN, some sort of international statement that declares the importance of protecting genetic privacy above, above and beyond other types of privacy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in favor of, of, of creating an ownership situation, but maybe the uh, person who asked the question, I got the impression would be. So I would like to hear the arguments in favor. In the, in the US, it's been a subject of, dis, um, of court cases uh, and uh, famously in the uh, case of uh, John Moore's spleen, it was ruled by the California uh, Supreme Court that he did not have a property right in his DNA uh, and that uh, other courts have uh, uh, supported that quite broadly. Um, the problem of uh, ownership of uh, and, and copyright or, or patent protection in your DNA uh, could uh, uh, make, could make for uh, a troubling situations uh, and in the research context, uh, which might might involve patenting, I mean, payments to uh, to people uh, based on their discoveries. On the other hand, it has been proposed, and uh, I think might be workable to uh, have uh, to set up uh, organizations or boards like um, uh, the uh, the organization that governs copyright of songs. Uh, so where your songs being downloaded uh, could uh, give you a micro payment. So that could be a solution for uh, uh, large studies that, uh, uh, that use DNA, you know, use genetic information from uh, thousands of people. Um, Yelna, did you want to contribute to that particular aspect or should we move on? Not to particularly. I did notice, though, that um, the, the uh, uh, person who raised the question um, would like to maybe ask if there's a way of uh, giving some sort of proprietary right without leading towards monetization or commodification. And that's a thing that arose in my mind. I mean, yeah. the, the person is, I think, stuck with the anonymous title, and I don't know how to enable them to speak for themselves. But um, something that arose in my mind, I think that the speaker was also going to say, is there a mechanism? Uh, I, I think about um, equity, principles of equity and uh, pro um, property intersecting in English um, common law, at least. I'm not familiar with the American jurisprudence. But is there a way of isolating a proprietary interest in DNA, maybe a sui generis one, where um, you can't so easily monetize it? I mean, I fully accept the, the risks of commodification and monetization and all of the complications. And I would also much rather see a, a, an actionable right that protects that rather than a proprietary interest. But maybe that's the, the only thing that I have to comment on, on that. Uh, thanks, Yelena. I think uh, Des had a question or a comment to make. Right, right. and it actually flows on from that um, well. Um, I mean, I think like, like Yelena, I, I, I think that ownership and monetization are not necessarily the same thing. We own our own bodies, but that doesn't mean that we're free to monetize them however we want. There are plenty of rules in lots of areas that prevent us selling ourselves into slavery, surrogacy. We can't just cut off a limb and sell it to someone to eat. There's plenty of ways in which we could think about disaggregating ideas of, of ownership and monetization. But I think that, that that leads on to the underlying theme, I think, in some ways of all of the papers today has been what's been called in some areas data colonialism. And I think it's a really suggestive, helpful kind of label because we think of colonialism as a situation where people came to other countries and they said, great, nobody owns this, we can take it. And, and they're completely oblivious, right, to the people who actually lived there and the land that they owned and Jay's, you know, um, re reference to the um, Veil of Tears and all of that is points to the ways in which colonialism assumed just a right to take 
what was was not recognised as being owned. And that's the language of data, data colonialism is that this is happening to us all the time. Mm-hmm. And genetics is just one area in which that, that colonialism takes place. Facebook is a classic example of colonialism, which just takes our image and, and all sorts of things and uses it however the damn, you know, however they choose. So so I think the colonialism language is, is very helpful. But that also reminds me then about the problems of regulation. If we think of colonial, colonialism as an early example of globalism, globalization in which there was, you know, broadly speaking, a kind of a race to the bottom rather than people, you know, building better practices and regulatory structures and, and things like that. And so my question is, um, my question is we, we already know about the ways in which regulatory structures around the world lead to tax havens. Um, are we looking at already or will we be looking at data havens where different countries will see that in their interests to create very lax legal structures that don't reflect mm. human rights or whatever and therefore people those data will migrate to those places because it's really it's perfectly migratable um globalized kind of product that kind of data so i guess the the the, the real question about regulatory structures is are we already or will we see the emergence of tax data havens to mm. support data colonialism. That's I, very chilling. Go ahead, Jennifer. I, no, I was just reacting, saying it was very chilling. It, it is chilling, yes. Um, the colonialism point is very apt. Um, uh, the GDPR, the, the regulatory uh, framework in Europe, has for some time and its previous iterations, actually from the 90s, but it, sort of in the last 10 years, some... Uh, former empires, um, Spain, Portugal, France, have been using um, the GDPR as a way of um, uh, tying international trade networks to the European Union in its Mm -hmm. former colonies, namely South South America. So where in South America you might have had a haven where someone might escape to and escape the GDPR, that is now being used as a condition on trade. And that's been written about by Lee Bygrave, I think, um, most recently about the those impacts of actually using regulation in order to bring um, former colonies into that. But that's that's a separate point. I think to I think your your um, analysis using colonialism is, is very apt. Um, and I think it also relates to the the, the point in, in my paper, quite apart from proprietary interests, um, that privacy is the starting point or the individual's ownership or however we want to call it is the starting point. It's not um, uh, terra nullius <laughs> where, um, you know, for whatever maybe collective justifications or whatever um, aims that um, a larger force might have, whether commercial or state, that that's that's the way in which I think we need to start thinking. That the starting point is the um, interest of the individual in privacy, whatever it covers, and then the justification has to come from the other party wishing to use that. And I think that's maybe missing in the genetic um, side of things, from what I've heard. Um, that the different um, legal frameworks don't yet coherently recognize an inherent interest, whether it be a right or a proprietary interest, of the individual in the gen- gen- their genetic material, that that leaves it open. Um, so I wonder whether that's um, something that uh, that sort of a change might address the concerns uh, raised. To respond to you, uh, Jelena, turn it down. Um, in, the, in the genetic um, Bill of Rights that was drafted in part by George Annas many years ago um, and and developed since then, there is a a reference to the individual's inherent intrinsic right to privacy. Uh, Notably uh, in uh, Article 7 and Articles 4, and they are also inferred. It is inferred in other in the other articles, the other ten articles. So, and that isn't um, an individualized approach to the question. It is a general approach. This draft of a genetic bill of rights. It's a generalized approach, like the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution, which refers to these individual rights. And so, what I think would happen then in that case would 
in a common law system would be that if a person feels that Article 7 or 8 was violated concerning him, himself or herself, then he would bring litigation or he or she would bring litigation and it would go into the normal court procedure. So taking care of the individual, but also creating a broad backdrop for everybody from a general approach uh, and which refers to this bottom line, which is the protection of an individual's privacy. I don't know if that uh, answers your, your query or your fear of, yes, not, of yes. it not being addressed. Yes, it's addressed in that instrument. I just wonder whether that instrument has entered the laws in, for, for example, oh, well, the states. It hasn't yet. No, so that's that's what, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's very interesting the different ways in which the law on the ground um, makes certain assumptions about um, genetic material. Um, so you've demonstrated there is an instrument there that could be used, but we haven't taken that step yet, which exposes mm -hmm. the dangers which Des has, has outlined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe Anne had a question she wanted to ask. Um, um, yes, um, thank you to um, our three speakers for um, three very um, stimulating um, talks. Um, I have um, three questions, comments. Um, my first would be for Yelena. Um, you actually um, um, uh, pointed towards one possible solution, which would be to um, assess um, costs and benefits of um, any types of uh, infringement on, on liberty. Um, my question would be, and there's not necessarily any answer, but the idea of using the phrase cost and benefit is the impression that it is a rational, scientific, um, um, uh, accessible um, uh, uh, calculus that we can carry out. Um, the problem is that that's what we see also with, with the um, pandemic right now is that um, the, there is absolutely no knowledge about either the, the very vague and um, um, unsure knowledge of both the costs and the benefits to be derived from any type of policy. Um, and there is no consensus about it. So um, um, to a certain extent, to, is it really possible to make that cost benefit assessment um, when you are making policies or is it only with hindsight um, um, after the event that you can actually determine whether you've actually taken the right um, uh, policy? Mm -hmm. And my second um, question or comment was, was about Jennifer's um, um, speech. Um, I really like the way in which you used the, the, the phrase intimate diary to refer to um, genetics because it actually blends in together both the technical legal aspect of genetics and, and um, uh, the way in which genetics is represented. Uh, um, um, and, um, and the way in which um, you dealt with genetics in a way that tied in with what we said previously in the previous sessions. Um, I was thinking of um, the session on policing uh, with um, Benita's um, presentation on predictive policing that um, relied on algorithms. And here you can also say, see that in the way in which you presented um, the use of genetics could be used also in order to carry out um, predict predictive policing, uh, both in the, in the area of health, but also in the area of um, 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 policing um, uh, and criminal law. Uh, I had um, a third also comment or question um, for um, Jay. Um, when um, the, the um, corpus you, you deal with um, deals specifically with the issue of genetics, um, in that corpus, um, um, is it always associated with an idea of surveillance? That's it. Right, shall I go first? Thank you, Anne, very much. That's um, an excellent question. And um, I'm never comfortable using cost-benefit analysis when we're dealing with uh, fundamental rights or fundamental entitlements. And I always um, steer away from um, the scholarship, maybe of Posner and for Mule and the likes, who would apply readily cost-benefit analysis where it, um, it could help the state to come to 
legitimise justifiable um, policies that might or might not interfere with individual liberties. And they wrote quite extensively about that um, in the context of uh, terrorism and um, indeed in the context of using torture. Um, I don't want to go there and I don't agree with their work on that, but, but um, I will say that when we're dealing with the same quantity security and when individual security is being um, put into attention with collective security in a particular circumstance, a factual circumstance, then I think the, the state or the governmental apparatus will have to engage with um, particularized evidence-based I hesitate again to use the word balancing of costs and benefits, because what I think is the the main point is that the burden of proof lies on the state if the state wishes to interfere, if the state wishes to remove from the individual something that the individual is understood to have. And okay, so the state might refer to collective interests, right, in order to legitimize that. But my point is that it's not enough. So which way, in, what's the way in which the state can discharge that burden well, it's not easy, but I think uh, cost-benefit analysis um, is a, a starting point, a framework for the state to concentrate upon, to gather the evidence that we do have. And there are a lot of things that we don't know. But from what we do have, is there a way of demonstrating that the state has discharged that burden of proof, that uh, now these measures, for example, surveillance measures, in liberal democracies can be used. So the tracking app is, is um, not a normal <laughs> situation for a liberal democracy. It has to be justified by the state. Um, less still um, one of those physical attachments to your body to track where you're going. And it's not just the principle of it. I'm concerned with the principle, but there are effects which Jay has mentioned in terms of the effects on the most vulnerable in society, those who have less economic or social power. If you need to have an app that tracks you or a physical device in order to access services which you otherwise would more easily have accessed, the state had been giving them to you and you are in a vulnerable position, then that leads to all sorts of other consequences that, again, a liberal state is a liberal state, governmental apparatus should not be participating in. So, the, the burden of proof has to be discharged. The starting point might well be cost-benefit analysis when we're dealing with individual versus collective interests of the same value. I hope that sort of answers your very good question. Should I go? Okay, thanks a lot, Anne, for that question. Yes, the, the metaphor of the intimate diary was, was put forth once again by George Annis, who was really a... Um, pioneer in this area of genetic privacy. And um, I always thought it was an interesting one because as he says, uh, genetic information is even more than an intimate diary because sometimes it has information about you that you don't even know. <clears throat> and to answer your question then, to, to extend that idea of an intimate diary to policing and to surveillance, indeed one of the uh, fears of acts, of, uh, of allowing access to third parties uh, to your genetic information is that is a question of storage. And I think Jay mentioned this. When, you're, when your genetic information is collected, it's going to be stored somewhere. As Jay said, there are so many places in the US where it is stored. And over time, I mean, nobody can predict what's going to happen uh, tomorrow, the day after. But in, in any event, your intimate diary, your genetic information is being stored somewhere. And in a in a decade or in less than that, um, it can be used by the state, by a, a malevolent state, by a malevolent third party against you or against people who are related to you. And the, the example of the uh, San Francisco, oh, I forgot what the, the, the term was, Jay, maybe you can help me out. The man who was arrested thanks to the fact that his DNA was related to somebody who had given her DNA to ancestry DNA for a, a, a ancestry check or to two, three and me, I can't remember, is an example of that. Um, and so this is one or one of the real concerns, that of storage. Who, where is it stored? Who has access to this stored information? Uh, once you give your informed consent, you don't have access to it anymore. It's going to be in a third party. 
and what is the degree of sanctions or or um, li liability of these third parties that are going to use this information that is stored against your interests, against your personal interests. So the idea that this is an intimate diary, an intimate diary is going to be stored in your home or you're going to give it to somebody in your family. And then later on, if you're a famous person, it's gonna be used for a, a biography or something like that. Probably against your will or maybe not. I don't know, it depends on what you say about it. But uh, genetic information doesn't have that same um, lack of, of, of um, it, it is much more charged with information, um, I would say, than an intimate diary because it doesn't, it doesn't only involve you, it involves people around you and your descendants and their descendants, et cetera. So it's even more than an intimate diary. Just to comment briefly uh, on Yelena's uh, point, uh, uh, I think uh, the right to privacy, which is a very late conception in um, uh, jurisprudence, uh, as you obviously know, uh, was first articulated in the 1880s, um, it seems uh, only one approach uh, that would further uh, result in right, rights-based work uh, seems us uh, to privatize the the question and the harms as well as the cost and the benefits uh, whereas uh, legislation and social uh, policy uh, efforts can speak I think to much uh, much wider uh, sets of interests than merely the individual's interests uh, it's really striking uh, in the how how widespread the harms and how even multi general generational the harms can be from loss of privacy and so to put the burden um, you know uh, and also of course the the uh, the state is not the only one uh, entity that we need protection from as as you know and as you're vividly shaking your head in agreement with so i see that uh thank you ann for your question just uh the no the, absolutely not that uh the films do with a panel plea of genetic monsters, cloning, uh, bioterrorism, uh, every possible topic. But you'd be surprised at how often uh, in the course of it, a privacy or a breach of privacy or surveillance uh, is a motif. And of course, genetic uh, surveillance in the genetic sphere is uh, only one of any number of conspiracy theories that haunt the public consciousness uh, uh, in cinema and television. Okay, um, I think we, oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Jennifer. I'm sorry, can I ask Jay a question? Sure. Um, what is the, time. excuse me. What is the, um, how long, first of all, how long is this project going to last? And ultimately, is the, uh, the production will be in a book or will it be in, in legislative proposals or more, more broader proposals? What is the ultimate outcome? The, um, we have, we have just completed our fourth year uh, and we're, we're, our grant was renewed uh, by the NIH for another four years. And so we're right in the middle of it. Uh, and the, uh, we, uh, this multidisciplinary project uh, works via publications in individual disciplinary journals with the goal of uh, uh, synthetic uh, recommendations, uh, which we are beginning to articulate uh, right at the end of our fourth year um, uh, of the project. Um, I have edited and have a special issue coming out of the Journal of Literature and Science with uh, seven papers uh, from our team. Uh, we've published over 30 papers already. Some uh, have been uh, uh, really really prominent in the legal sphere. We were the first uh, uh, group to publish in the Yale Law Journal on um, the issue of uh, the privacy policies on direct 
consumer genetic testing. So uh, we have, uh, if you go to our website, we have uh, already quite a quite a wide range of publications in <laughs> dozens of different. Uh, actually, I won't plural. I won't make dozens plural, but uh, approaching a dozen different disciplinary areas. That's great. Okay, um, so I think we have run out of time, uh, unfortunately, already. Yes. So we're going to, yes. Uh, so we're going to end the, the session now. So we'll give a round of virtual applause to Yelena, Jennifer, and Jay uh, for three wonderful papers and a very stimulating discussion. Um, so the next session of the webinar is next Monday. And uh, we will be looking at critical perspectives on surveillance, which includes uh, colonialism, which was um, already discussed a little bit already. So that's our transition uh, to um, part number five. Um, so we'll wish you a pleasant day or night, depending on where you are um, located. And um, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.